Hey YouTube, Gordon Miller here. All right, um, I was taking my son to robotics and uh, I, uh, I we had a really great conversation on the way and I thought I would share uh, some of it with you. The, um, the conversation was around uh, education and how education has changed uh, over the years. Uh, now, understand that uh, the public school education process was brought into existence uh, in the uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, as a um, as a necessary evil to educate kids who needed to participate in uh, in the Industrial Revolution uh, in, on the factory floor uh, to develop uh, to help you know put together stuff for manufacturing. So um, part of the whole reason that we have schools these days is so people can slave away for low wages. Uh, in the name of uh, large businesses. And um, I, I think that we fail to recognize that. Uh, and, and I think that's part of, the, part of the problem. I think we believe that there's some altruistic reason for educating the children. Uh, the reason for educating the children is so that they can, uh, they can help big businesses make huge profits. So I, I don't necessarily think that the motivation is always genuine. Now, <clears throat> the program for public education used to go only to sixth grade. And after sixth grade, you went to work. And, you know, that's 13 years old. So uh, chances are, you know, if you ask the average 13 year old whether they wanted to work in the factory or uh, go do something else, they would probably want to, you know, go do something else. But, you know, back then you either worked on a farm in agrarian jobs or you had an industrial manufacturing job. It was just kind of the, the way that the things were. And um, so you either worked on the farm uh, if, you know, you get, get your education and, uh, and go back and help out on the farm or you, um, uh, you went to work uh, in, in the mines or the mills or, you know, various other places like that. So um, about 1960, when uh, President Kennedy was president, uh, he he uh, challenged the United States to uh, beat the Russians to the moon, to you know be the first one to put somebody on the moon, uh, and uh, that challenge required a change in education, where we added more science, technology, engineering, and math (STEM) uh, courses to our standard educational program. See, back in the 1900s, 1920s, um, only about, you know, 10% of the people went to college. And uh, as we come further into the World War II era, uh, more like 25% of the people went to college. And then in the 60s and 70s, where it became more, um, it became more fashionable to go to college because it was the focus on the, on the development of the liberal arts education in college was a huge factor in that. And so, you know, I think that the, you know, part of the reason for, um, for the growth in college has been the, um, the fact of a, a liberal arts education. And so, um, sorry, you know, reflections off my, off my glasses. So, um, anyway, um, so in the 1960s, um, President Kennedy needed computational engineers to do the calculations in order to get uh, us to the moon. We didn't have the kind of calculators and, and computer hardware that we have now. Uh, right now, uh, what, uh, what used to take 100 computers, meaning human beings trained in mathematics, uh, or calculators as they were called, uh, calculators, uh, instead of 100 calculators, uh, you can have one person with a smartphone and you can do the same calculations they did in a fraction of the time. So you don't need as many people. But yet we still have this holdover from the 1960s where we have trigonometry and calculus and all the higher mathematical functions that they insist that everybody learn. Well, the reason that everybody needed to learn that is we didn't know, you know, how much of those skills we were going to need. How many engineers was it going to take to get to the moon? You know, how, how much did we need to, to teach everybody? You know, uh, and, and we have a lot of great engineering jobs now, whether it's, you know, fit, uh, mechanical engineering, computer engineering, uh, civil engineering, uh, you know, aerospace engineering. All, all those jobs require computational mathematics in order to be able to do that. And, and that's fine. Um, but 
you know, if you look at it, only 67% or so of the people ever go to college. And of those 67% that go to college, uh, only about 30 to 35% uh, of, of the total uh, really are in those technical jobs for either doctors or, um, uh, or um, lawyers or, you know, engineers and things like that. And they, they really need some of those specialized courses. But the rest of us, you know, the rest of everybody else doesn't. And so you're talking about, you know, 30% or <clears throat> 30-some percent of the population never goes to college. 30-some percent of the population doesn't do well enough in college to get a STEM-type job. And instead of actually focusing on things that matter, like teaching them how to balance their checkbook, you know, the average person uh, only needs to add and subtract. Most of them can't multiply and divide worth shit. So, <clears throat> in fact, about the only division that somebody needs uh, in their everyday life who's not in a technical position is there's a dozen donuts in the break room and there's four of us left. How many, do, how many donuts do each of us get? Three. So um, that's about the extent of division. Uh, you know, I would, be, I would be happy if we taught people how to add and subtract. And uh, I was watching a video on YouTube the other day about how to pay off your mortgage in five years. And they, were, they wrote, a, wrote a little book, the book was like 40 pages long. You know, it used to be that a book was, had to be 96 pages or no publisher would publish it. And um, just like no movie could be a commercial entity to get distribution unless it was at least 91 minutes long. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting situation that, um, you know, you find because uh, these folks wrote an entire book about how to pay off your mortgage and yet they were talking on camera about uh, a 30-year mortgage and how many payments that was. And they couldn't calculate how many, you know, with 12 payments a year times 30 years. You know, they, they tried for like 10 seconds, both of them. And these are seemingly educated people that wrote the book on mortgages, yet they don't understand that 30 years times 12 is 360 payments. So uh, they did the math in their head, and they're like, "Oh, it's like, oh, it's like 300 and some payments, yeah, 360." So uh, you know, we need to focus on making people more functionally literate, and we don't do nearly enough in terms of language. You know, we need to focus on. Uh, I think I think the average American should know three languages. I think you need to know English, obviously. Uh, I think that uh, because there's a over a billion people in Central and South America, and they live just south of us, it'd probably be a good idea to know Spanish too. And I think it's important that you know at least one Asian language. Uh, I would choose either Chinese or Japanese. Uh, and, you know, I think it's important that everybody understand how to communicate in the native language of some of the people that you're going to be doing business with. And I, I read something the other day that said that uh, in the next 20 to 50 years, they expect that there'll only be three languages in the entire world, English, Spanish, and Chinese. Uh, I, I don't know if that's true. It could be true. Um, and there's lots of dialects and lots of other, uh, you know, other issues there in uh, hundreds of languages. So uh, I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, it seems reasonable that if you want to succeed in a global economy, you're going to need to know those three languages. Uh, or at least two of the three. Uh, and I'm sorry that I didn't learn uh, Spanish. I took French instead. Uh, and, um, you know, you can use it in Quebec, where it's cold as shit, and I have no desire to go. And you can use it in France, where they fucking hate Americans. So um, take your pick. Both of them suck. So we're doing work in South America, in Peru, and, and things like that. And, you know... The most of those countries are all Catholic, which, you know, I'm Catholic, so I love that. Um, but they speak Spanish. And, um, you know, it would be nice to be able to do business with them, uh, you know, effectively. So one of the things I'm going to do is uh, I'm starting to learn uh, Spanish. And actually, it's funny because when the guys from Peru were here uh, listening to them talk for, you know, three or four days, uh, I was able to... Uh, uh, after a while, I was able to understand what they were saying, which is kind of funny. Uh, I was able to follow along. They're like, hey, you, you can speak Spanish. And I go, no, I don't speak Spanish, but I can understand what you're saying. So, um, But, you know, I, I think the educational program, the whole educational process needs an overhaul. 
if you think about it, we set it up in the early 1900s. Uh, it got changed dramatically towards STEM in 1960. And the program has gone pretty much unchanged for the last, you know, 55 years. And um, I think it's important that we, you know, look for opportunities to evolve education in a direction more consistent with the success of the average person, not just the average American, but I think we need to, we need to focus on the kind of things that make sense. You know, we've lost all use for American history. Uh, nobody knows, you know, I mean, oh you know, yes, there's George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. <clears throat> if you want to teach those things, you know, those people are on our money. So, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, those are about the only people that anybody remembers. Uh, and it's funny, you ask the average American, um, they probably can't tell you who the last president was or the three presidents before that in terms of just, you know, going back in secession. So, but if you don't know that Clinton, Bush, and Obama were the last three presidents, then first of all, I don't know why you even have the right to vote. Uh, but you know, the reality is you got the right to vote. Um, but you know, you're not, <clears throat> you're not smart enough to be able to even contribute in any kind of meaningful way to the United States. So, and it's not your fault. You know, my, my whole thing is that, uh, the education system has failed you. And I think it's important to fundamentally alter the way in which education is done. And I think that's what I'm going to spend some time focusing on. I think, uh, you know, I would much rather see, you know, first through sixth grade, you know, be the, the base and that middle school is where you start separating people into two tracks where you've got a track that, you know, you know, is college bound and you, then another one that really probably is not going to become a rocket scientist and use the full four years of high school with these two groups in two fundamentally different ways. You know, it does no good for, <clears throat> for a student to be subjected to C's and D's uh, where they know they're not going to get into college. You know they're going to get a 520 uh, on their SATs in English and a 510 in mathematics. They're not going to get into any college. They may go to community college. You know, the, the sad thing about it is, is that the kids that score a 510 or a 520 on their SATs, those kids are the ones with a 520 credit score too. So, you know, we fundamentally failed as a country to provide the necessary education to kids to have them be productive members of society. And I, I don't blame the people who, who are suffering as a result of a failed uh, educational system. Uh, I think it's time to fundamentally, you know, fix that. And um, so anyway, that was the observations from today. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the, the book Hidden Figures is one that my son's been reading for a summer reading list. And uh, it talks all about the space program and the way they were training people for uh, those uh, high paying tech engineering jobs back in the 60s when we needed them to go to the moon. But, you know, the space program is gutted. NASA barely exists anymore. You know, there's no, we're not, there's no moonshot. Uh, you know, so I, I just don't think that our educational system is structured in a way that's beneficial for everybody. And I think we need to figure out what that, what that is and fundamentally change that uh, in a way that makes the most sense for the most people in the United States. So, you know, that's just something to think about. Uh, you know, I think that we, um, we do a great disservice to two thirds of the people in the country. And, you know, we need to be focusing more on, on world history, you know, understanding that most of the people alive today who are in the workforce were not even alive when the Berlin Wall came down. And they don't understand what it was like before when Russia was, you know, the, the USSR. You know, they don't remember what it was like. They weren't alive. And, or if they were alive, they were really young. And so I think in a world economy, we need more world history. I think we need more world language. I think we need some basic mathematics that people actually can embrace uh, in a way that makes them functional 
in a society that's part of a global economy. And, um, you know, I, I think we need to go back to <clears throat> some of the, um, you know, some of the opportunities. I think we need to create a curriculum that embraces alternative employment solutions, including some of the entrepreneurial ones. I think we need to come up with a strategy where we can, we can create growth on some of these new jobs. But I tell you, you know, me starting my own company had nothing to do with, you know, my ability in biology to do dissection. In fact, for me, you know, I took a D in biology because I refused to do the dissection. Uh, that's because they brought the mice in about a week before uh, we were going to dissect them. And we made friends with them, we named them, we played with them. And then when it came time for the dissection, they used ether to put them to sleep. And we cut them open while they were still alive. And um, I, I, there were, I thought there was something fundamentally wrong with that. I mean, I understand that if you're going to be a doctor and you're going to have to cut people open, you have to deal with that emotion and stuff like that. But I felt that something that was alive, that, you know, for us to cut them open and continue cutting them open until they died just didn't seem like quite the right thing to do. I mean, I, I, don't, I never regret taking the D in biology. Uh, I, uh, I, I thought it was a cruel and inhumane thing to do to the mice. I think it was a cruel and evil and sadistic thing to do to the kids. Uh, you know, my son just did the fetal pig dissection, and um, and that's great. The pigs are already dead. Uh, they have to be refrigerated, so you know they're fine. They're not going to feel anything. But dissecting live animals until they're not alive anymore—that's fucked up. You know, I mean, I I just don't. I mean, and we wonder why these kids, you know, torture animals and why they do all kinds of mean and evil shit. Well, look at the mean and evil shit we make them do in school. I mean, come on, you know. So I think it's time for a fundamental change in education. If you've got some ideas about how you think education should change,